Is it fair to blame Dan Campbell for the Lions losing to the 49ers in the NFC title game? We are reacting to a video from Jackson Kruger Sports. No relation to Freddie, I'm sure. So I want to break down. We talk about analytics a lot on this channel. We talk about decision points and in-game management. So I, I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about this. Very, very polarizing topic. So Dan Campbell made some controversial yet brave decisions at the end of the uh, NFC title game. All backfired. All didn't work. And a lot of the conversation is which decisions were wrong. You know, did Dan Campbell single-handedly lose in the game? And then there's a bigger topic on why teams are still running the head coaching position the way that they do. And why aren't they outsourcing some of the decision points? And we'll talk about that at the end. So we're going to go through each situation. And I'll let you know what I would do, what I think should have happened. Let me know in the comments below what you think should happen with each of these decisions. Well, all right. Dan Campbell taking a lot of heat for what went wrong against the San Francisco 49ers. And listen, anytime your team blows a big lead, you're going to get a lot of heat. Whether it's fair or unfair, that's just how it works. Ask Kyle Shanahan, uh, who's been on the other side of those plenty of times. But Dan Campbell also had some decisions that were just questionable along with this. You know, some fourth down decision making. The first one was this one, which... So... Real quick, the way I would quantify a coach's role in, in this situation is that you could definitely say the decisions themselves never cost the team the game because the team saw us to perform. You know, in this game, we saw the Brandon Ayuk touchdown or the catch off of his face mask, or, you know, the defender's face mask. We saw the uh, Jameer Gibbs fumble. So a lot of other things happened. The coach's role in this spot is to consistently put his team in the best position to win. That's it. That's all they're trying to do with each decision. Which decision gets me closer to winning? Which decision puts my team in the most efficient possible spot? He could have done all of these decisions the other way and still lost. So just because it's a right or a wrong decision doesn't change the result. Conversely, the result working out for you or not working out for you doesn't make a decision right or wrong, okay? So you have to remove yourself from the result and you have to put yourself in the in the perspective of inside of the vacuum of the decision, which decision point, which decision do I need to make to keep my team in the most, the best position to win the game, the most efficient position, the most EV position. That's how a coach should look at all of these decision points. Is, you know, there's currently at, at the 28-yard line, it's a fourth down and two. And so in a given situation, this actually isn't a bad idea typically. This So I think it is. Okay, so, man, I wish they wouldn't have shown that. So, all right, fourth and two, third, it's third quarter, seven minutes left. You're up 14. You're on the 20, what do you say, the 28-yard line? You're on the 28-yard line. So right here, your decision point is, do we go for it or do we kick a field goal? I think you have to kick the field goal in this spot because if you get it, what is your reward? Let's say you get five yards. What's your reward? You have the ball in the 23. You could throw a pick. You could fumble. You could have to end up having to kick a field goal anyways. Having the ball on the 23 is not a huge reward in this spot. What you want to do in this spot, the most efficient way to victory, is to just keep the clock running. Just extend the, extend the game, force extra possessions. They're up two, two scores, two possessions in the spot, up 14. The field goal is a whole new possession. All right, they're not going from up three to up six. They're going from up 14 to up 17. So now, no matter what, they're forcing the Niners to find an extra possession. The biggest thing on their side in this situation is the clock. The fact that it's only seven minutes left in the third quarter. We're getting closer to the end of the game. We're in the back half of the game. So that extra possession forcing on the Niners is vital. And yeah, you're not guaranteed. You're not guaranteed to make this field goal. You, you're probably around the 80% success rate. But I would, I guarantee you, 80% success rate to make the field goal is way better. And sorry if you hear any sirens going on downtown New Orleans. I mean, what do you mean to do? It's every day. I mean, you hear this? It, ladies and gentlemen, it, 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 try sleeping with this. Okay, try sleeping in the middle of downtown. You got sirens, you got alarms, you got people screaming outside my window, uh, trumpet players, saxophone players outside my window every day. 80% to make the field goal is much better of a chance 
then converting this, then scoring from the 23. Because you still have to continue the drive. So Bad idea, typically. This is what analytics say. Analytics do say you have a better chance to go for it. And let's go through and figure out exactly why. What's the logic here? Because, again, I think sometimes people say, oh, analytics go or don't go. But, but, th but this right here, see, I don't think. So if I'm looking at this, you have a 59% likelihood of converting on the fourth down. So then what is your what is the likelihood of converting on the fourth down and then scoring a touchdown? Because it's way worse than 59%, obviously. And if you're doing if you have a almost 20% less success rate to go for it and get it with no reward or make the field goal and go up three scores and it only changes your win percentage by 3%, to me this, if I looked at this chart in real time, this this right here even further tells me, okay, I need a kick. I need a kick right here. But don't really dive deeper into why. Mm -hmm. And again, it's essentially the chances of making it uh, in terms of going for it versus getting the field goal are not as different as you might expect. In fact, right here, it says there's only a 15% higher chance to kick the field goal than to convert on the fourth down and two. And that's right. That, that, makes, to that makes total sense. Like, if you told me there's a 15% difference between making a 45-yard field goal or whatever it is, or getting three yards, I would, yeah, I would, I would expect it to be like this. But you're not just trying to get three yards. That's the most important thing here is that getting the three yards is not the gets you to the reward. It, it's not, you know, that that's not what you're trying. That's not ultimately what you're trying to do. Right around where Detroit's kicker has been uh, over his you know, over the season is right in that area from this section of the field. Another good way to look at that is let's say you convert this fourth down and then you go incomplete pass, you run for no gain, incomplete pass, and it's fourth and ten. You're going to kick it, right? You're you're going to kick the field goal. So, which that could certainly happen, could absolutely happen. You 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 still got to finish the drive. So it was no guarantee. Everyone said, well, if they took the points, that would have been six more points. We don't know that, right? Because there is a ch actually a decent chance that one of those field goals could have missed. And the idea behind it, of course, is that if you convert, you can potentially get more than just three points. And, and yes, it's kind of a, down, a bad thing to do that because you're making it a two-score game if you do not uh, score points. And you do have a higher chance of scoring points if you kick the field. What I wish they had right here in this column would be what is the percentage success of scoring a touchdown from from their and that's in that situation. What's the what's the success? Because if that success is like 20% and you're looking at 20% versus 75% field goal i think the lions logic here was it's still too early to be going for uh you know take just take the points here and try to play the score game instead try to play to let's get as many points as possible make the score as wide as possible instead of be up as many scores as possible that's the logic and you see i mean again it is worth mentioning the play is fine like this is a good example of the result like i think this, the decision was bad if i think it's josh reynolds if josh reynolds makes this catch all of a sudden, it looks like a smart thing to do, right? But th this is where I'm saying you got to kind of remove the actual in-game variables from the decisions. Because watching this play, it's like, okay, the player, the player messed up here. The player should have made the catch. This play worked. I mean, it was a relatively good play by Goff to get around to pressure. He, you know, uh, didn't make a perfect throw, but he was under pressure. However, also you got to look at that as you know a, a very catchable pass that was not caught there. To me, that's kind of the biggest thing I would point towards there is like, again, we love to blame the coaches when things go wrong, but Campbell gave his players a chance and the players didn't come through here. So, all right. So this one, all right. So now we're in the fourth quarter. There's seven minutes and 38 seconds left. The score is 24, 27. They're on the 30 yard lines, fourth and three. What would you do? This one, I go for it because you're go if you kick it, right. If you kick it here, you're tying the game. San Francisco is, they just scored. Like San Francisco, at this point, you're not stopping them. Your defense isn't great. You're on the road. So in my mind, if I kick it here and I tie it up, San Francisco is going down and scoring. They, they are dominating me at this point. It, oh, and there's absolutely no guarantee. I'm going to make a 47-yard field goal. 
So in this spot, I think this is the spot you do go for it. This is the spot you do go for it because of all the things I just laid out. I wouldn't, I would not kick here. Okay, what about the next one? Fourth down and three. And this one's another situation where, so fourth down and three, seven and a half minutes left, and you're currently down three points. It's one of those things where, you know, logic almost immediately tells you why in the world wouldn't you just kick a field goal here, right? Why would you risk you know, still being down? You have a chance to tie the game. Well, again. But same, same exact thing. If you look at just risk reward, all right, what is my reward? Well, my reward is that I tie the game, seven minutes left, and then I have to try and stop San Francisco, which I have not been able to do. What's my risk? You know, my risk is I'm kind of in the same spot because no matter what, I have to stop San Francisco, Right. If, if it's tied 27-27 with seven minutes left, or I'm down three with seven minutes left, if I have to stop San Francisco on their next possession and I get the ball back, then I'm thinking if I take my risk and fail and I succeed in stopping San Francisco, which I had to do anyways, then I have another shot at scoring a touchdown or kicking a field goal to tie it. So I can get, I can get back to that as long as I do the, the holding them the possession after this. The point of football is not to get to overtime. The point is to win the football game. I think sometimes we logically just don't think that way because you almost think like the goal is to not lose. But no, the goal is to win. So that's that's part. So well said. So this another to go back to what I just said, you have to have the line of victory in your mind. The previous play what's the line of victory. Just let the clock run. The line of victory is you're up 14. The line of victory is if we just keep putting points on the board, forcing possessions, the game is eventually going to run out and we're going to win. So that line of victory says take the three points, kick the field goal, go up 17, go up three scores. What's your line of victory here? The line of victory here is I've got to score. The line of victory here is I've got to score a touchdown. That's the line of victory because the line of victory isn't go to overtime. The line of victory isn't to tie the game. The line of victory is score, right? So so going for it here continues down the line of victory, which is what should be the foundation of like every decision. Part of an important thing to talk about. And again, the numbers do say slight edge to go for. And both of these are slight in both sides. I should mention that as well. These are, in my opinion, complete. And I don't think analytics do get this weird connotation of like some people believe you have to just go by the analytics but you have to merge the analytics with the game state the game state is important the game state you know there are humans playing there is an element of there is a game happening in the background of this this isn't just flipping quarters this isn't just you take meta analysis and then it spits out a, a, a something that happens you know you do have to take in into account what's actually happening on the field so if something says you have a 1% better chance if you do this, you've got to factor in a bunch of other stuff. You can't just blindly say like, well, it's a 1% better thing, so I got to do it. That's not, that's not how this works. Reasonable minds can differ. I don't think there is a right or wrong answer, in my opinion, to these. I think it's debatable. But, uh, you know, here, again, the logic is relatively simple. Uh, you know, again... 71% chance to make a field goal from here. It's a 47-yard field goal. They don't have a kicker with a huge leg, which maybe that's something to address in the offseason. I don't know, but they don't have a kicker with a huge leg. So it's not a guaranteed make if you kick it here. Whereas if you go for it, again, slightly less likely that you're going to convert. But if you do convert, you're in a significantly much better position to then go on and win. If you look all the way at the right of these of this chart, you know, uh, the percentage of winning if they convert would be 40%. If they kick the field goal, they're still looking at just 32%. So you're, you know, either way, it's still in the San Francisco 49ers favor here, but it's certainly no guarantee that, uh, you know, you are like going to overtime if you kick a field goal here. Again, this time, nobody able to get open. I think you have to give credit to the 49ers defense here for covering it up. Goff does what he can, but wasn't a lot he could do there. So again, Got At the end of the day, players have to make plays, right? And the Lions players weren't able to make Very plays. True. And the, you know, uh, the 49ers uh, players were. This week sequence to me was... Okay, now this is the worst part. This is the part that there isn't, there isn't any question. This is by far the worst thing that Dan Campbell did. So it's third and goal, 24 to 34. They're down 10. There's a minute and five seconds left. The Lions have all three timeouts. They have the ball in the one. 
The only thing you can't do here is call a timeout. The second you call a timeout, the game is over. You're down two scores. You have to either score two touchdowns, kick a field goal, score a touchdown. You, you know how this goes, right? If you call a timeout, you have to get the onside kick. Onside kick success rate is 3%. So the second you call a timeout, you are okay with accepting you have a 97% chance to lose. What I think the Lions sh should have done is when they got to like the 20-ish, 25, somewhere in there, when they were comfortable with the field goal, they should have thought about kicking the field goal. They, sh they should have thought about, you know what, let's not kill any more clock. Let's just do the first part of this because we have to score twice. Let's just kick the field goal. Kick the field goal, then kick off, then we'll try and stop them, call our timeouts, get the ball back, and we'll see what happens. That should have been the first thought, all right? How close do we need to get to just kick a field goal? Let's not worry about bleeding any more clock. Let's not worry about any of that stuff. So then they get down here to the one. They decide to run the football. If you don't get in, you're going to either have to burn like 30 seconds of clock to either then rush a fourth down play with, with, with your season on the line, or you rush out your field goal unit, kick a field goal with 30 seconds left, then you try the, you know, hold them, call your timeouts, get the ball back with what? You know, 20 seconds left if you hold them and, and, and try and score a touchdown. So you cannot run here. Cannot run. Is the worst part in my opinion worth mentioning the clock was stopped so they had the entire time to think about what they wanted to do and you know the last two things fourth down decision making i'm just not going to be as hard on someone as some other people might be for something like that again everyone criticizes the fourth down call when it fails but you know credits it when it works if one of those hit everyone's calling dan campbell a genius like even if you disagree with the call you also probably agree that that is true right that if both those fourth down but that's the incorrect way of looking at it, right? Like I said, you have to remove yourself from the results. Anybody who is making these results-based review of decisions is just doesn't understand the, the game state. Uh, calls worked, then people will be crediting Dan Campbell this morning. Like if you're playing blackjack and someone hits on 20 and they get 21, you don't then say like, man, this guy's a genius. What a great decision. That's always a bad decision. He got lucky, you know, it just worked out. If the dealer has 20, if the dealer has 20 and you have 20, and you decide to hit, you get 21, it's not like brilliant decision because he won, because he beat the dealers 20. It's always bad. Right, 100%. But either way, you know, again, agree or disagree. To me, this is just objectively the wrong decision right here, where it's a third down and goal. What you have to do is you have to understand the situation. You need two scores. You have a minute and five seconds left. You're actually in an okay position, uh, as strange as that sounds. Not a great position, but if you can get a three and out after scoring, then you have a chance to, you know, with a minute left, probably a little under a minute, maybe, I don't know, uh, 40 to 50 seconds left, get one more drive going to try and see if you can tie the game. That's what. Well, the same thing, like I'm saying, like when they're on the, you know, I had to go back and look at the play-by-play -play and see what yard line they could have started thinking about this. But let's say they're on the 20. Like, let's say they're on the 20-yard line. And they're looking at making a 35-yard field goal-ish. And they're like, we're, we make that every time, right? Like, we're, we're always going to make a under a 40-yard field goal. Let's just, we would rather kick now, save 40 seconds, 50 seconds, whatever the situation was. Like, because the line of victory is two scores. The line of victory is we've got to score get the ball back and score again. The line of victory isn't we have to score a touchdown right here. The clock is way more valuable than running extra plays, bleeding extra clock, whittling that clock down because what San Francisco's line of victory? Bleed the clock. Their line of victory is bleed the clock or, you know, like in the game. So the more that the Lions are bleeding this clock and just and just wasting play after play after play trying to score, they're their efforts are not towards their actual line of victory. You have uh, you know, a chance to do here, but Dan Campbell does something very bizarre here. Watch as they call a running play. And listen, Dan Campbell doesn't call to offensive plays, obviously, but I'm sure he has. All right, so right here now, you, you call this running play oh, such a bad decision already, right? Such a bad decision. Now you've got... You're, you're, you either have the decision to let the clock run and 
I'm thinking they're going to kick a field goal. I'm thinking they're going to rush their field goal unit out there, kick, and then try and stop them, get the ball back. But then they do something even dumber. They call a timeout. So once they call that, the game's over anyways. Then they decide, let's, let's, tr- let's try and score. Let's try and score a touchdown, which is even dumber. Because if you don't score that touchdown, boom, now, now the season's really over. Right, so then they're just compounding the bad decisions because again, the touchdown doesn't do anything for them in that spot. They have to score twice. You have a much better chance of making this field goal, which is probably pretty close, like ninety-eight percent or something, is an extra point, than scoring the touchdown. So why are you taking the lesser, the lesser success rate when it doesn't change what what you what you ultimately have to do? As you know, again, he has to have a hand in this, and it's coaching regardless, whoever decision it was. I'm sure that Campbell, you know, he could have overrode this if he wanted to and said, No, we're throwing here. The timeout uh, is for go sure for Campbell's down. decision. Or you for just sure. say, You know what? If we're stopped, uh, you know, on this play, we just hurry up to the line and run our next play very quickly, right? What you can't do is call a timeout because now you have to get the onside kick. So this was a mistake. I also think there were just moments when, like, and, you know, like, like C.J. Garner Johnson hitting Debo Samuel after the play, like that's okay. So now, here now he didn't mention this play. And he doesn't mention the play the rest of the video. We go inside of a lava lamp or something. I'm not sure what's going on there. Now a lot of people say this is just how Dan Campbell is. A lot of people say this is just Dan Campbell. This is why we got here. He's a risk taker. He's a gambler. You know, I like this. This is this is how he went out. Well, let me take you back earlier in the game. 17 seconds left. The Lions are up 21 to 7. This is right before halftime. This is in the second quarter. Let's see what happens. So it's third and third and goal. And Jameer gives screen pass, doesn't work out, ends up on like the two yard line, the three, we'll call it the three yard line. Now, what should the Lions do? The Lions probably should go for it here because the reward. If they score, they're up big going into halftime. There's a lot of game left. If they score here, go up big. It's fourth and three, fourth and two, wherever they end up spotting it. You know, 10 seconds left. So this is a huge reward. What's the risk? Virtually nothing. The risk is virtually nothing because if you don't get it, San Francisco is at their own three with 10 seconds left. They're probably just kneeling out, probably just go to the half, right? Really not much risk at all. So right here, what's your line of victory? It's the second quarter. It's the first half. Your line of victory is to score points, to score more points, keep piling on. So the whole idea of, well, and let's see what let's see what Campbell does. Here, I would go for it. Fourth and three. You know your line of victory. You're on. You're no no risk at all. The risk you met you miss it. Let's go into the locker room. Let's take the chance. Campbell takes his timeout. Okay, fine. And I'll go ahead and give you all a spoiler. He decides to kick it. So he runs his kicker out here. This is my pushback to the whole, Dan, this is who Dan Campbell is, or this is who the Lions are. This is why they got there. Dan Campbell's a gambler. If he was, if that was all true, he would go for it right here. And this is the big difference. When you don't have anything backing up your decisions and you're just going off gut and feel and and emotions and whatever, when you're just flipping a coin, basically, you aren't putting your team in the most efficient spots. You're just guessing. Because if Dan Campbell wants to say, I'm always going to be aggressive, then he would have have gone here. I almost said hit because I was going to say, if somebody wants to always hit on 16 on the blackjack table, fine. But don't hit sometimes and stay sometimes. You know, don't, don't, if everything is equal, you know, if the, if the dealer's showing, if the dealer's showing a seven, let's just say, if the dealer's showing a seven and you're sitting there on 16, if you're a player that says, I'm, I'm going to stay, I'm always going to stay, fine. But it makes no sense to just randomly change it up. That means you're just guessing, right? And that this is what shows that Dan Campbell's guessing. He can say he's aggressive all he wants. 
he can say he's a gambler. He can say all these things, but then I, but then he has to tell me why he doesn't go for it here. Cause this makes no sense. Consistency. If you, if you start looking at consistency and philosophy and all that, this makes no sense at all. Here's the answer. And here's the bigger talking point. Why is the NFL so still so archaic where they have these head coaches and they expect them to do everything? It makes no sense why they don't let an offensive guy call the plays if they can't call the offensive plays, a defensive guy call the defensive plays if they can't do that, and then let somebody, whoever, be an analyst, an in-game analyst or an analytical team or whatever to, to figure these decisions out. It Imagine if there was a billion-dollar company Let's just say Amazon. Jeff Bezos built Amazon through his ideas and his, you know, what, whatever. It wouldn't make any sense for Jeff Bezos to be like, you know what? I also need to run the logistics of this, this one warehouse in this one city. You know, it's like, let someone else do that. It'll be way more efficient if their job is just to do that. You have no experience running this warehouse. You have no experience running the logistics of this one individual warehouse. You're really good at this overarching idea, you know, the culture, the, the theme, the identity, the, you know, the, the innovation, you're good at that. Go do that. You're use your skill set. Don't force yourself into something you're not good at. Dan Campbell's obviously a coach that his skill set is man management, building a culture, building that identity, connecting a team with a, with a fan base and a city. He, he's good at that. And that's fine. That's what you want your head coach to be. If that's what it is, that's what it is. Let Ben Johnson run the offense. Okay, Ben Johnson's a great offensive coordinator. Let him do that. Aaron Glenn, I don't think he's a great defensive coordinator, but whatever. If you have a good DC, let them do that. And then if you if you can't make these decisions, if you don't understand the reason behind them and you're just guessing, get somebody to do it. Get a group to do it, a, a coach to do it, whatever. These are multi-billion dollar teams. Why are they forcing head coaches just because they're head coaches to make all these little bitty decisions? Teams would be run so much more efficiently if they did not do this. Dan Campbell should not be the one calling the timeout in that spot because he, it's obvious he doesn't understand the game state. Dan Campbell shouldn't be the one making this decision right here if he's also the one making the other fourth down decisions because there's no continuity at all between those decisions. Get you someone who you trust to make the decision consistently to put your team in the efficient spot and let them do it. I, it, I, it blows my mind that we're still in a world where coaches are, are doing this. Coaches are good at certain things. That's why they're there. Not every coach is good at everything. Like Andy Reid, incredible coach. It wouldn't make any sense if Andy Reid was like, hey, Spags, let me call the defense. Say, like, Andy, you don't, you don't, that's not what you do. So, yeah, but I'm the head coach. I should be doing that. Similarly, a head coach could be just as confused about game state analytics and, and decisions and all that stuff. So, so, let someone else do it. And I think if the Lions would, would have had that person, if Dan Campbell wasn't the one making these decisions, they would have been in more efficient situations. Would, would the result have changed? I don't know, because you could go for it here, not get it. You could try and kick the field goal on the other one, miss it. You could go for it in the other one, not get it. You can you can be right in those decisions. Same with blackjack. I use blackjack as a metaphor because blackjack is so percentage based on your decisions. But you could always be making the right decision, and the cards just come up against you. You know, so it, it's a bigger conversation in a vacuum. I would say Dan Campbell didn't lose his team the game, but he did not put his team in the most efficient place to win the game consistently jameer gibbs's fumble and the brandon Ayuk catch and the drop pass by josh reynolds and all that all those things are part of why they lost the game but dan campbell did not help his team when he could have you know, he didn't increase their percentage to win when he could have which is his job you know he he, he just was kind of guessing and and he'll have to live with that so i hope teams start to take a more innovative approach and instead of having quality uh assurance coaches whose job is to we've all seen the coach on the sidelines whose job is to to hold the coach back on the sideline how about we get rid of those guys and how about we bring in somebody who can 
do some analysis real quick and spit out some percentages on when you should go for it, when you shouldn't, when you should call a timeout, when you shouldn't, and, and all of that. That let, let's let's do more of that, and let's take these coaches like Dan Campbell, these man managers, these motivators, these culture builders, and let's let them do that. Let's let them be good at doing that. Don't force them into play calling and timeouts and and game state and all that. Makes no sense. Let me know in the comments below what you think about this topic. Thank you for watching. I will see you in the next video.